All right, I'm, I'm jumping to the New Testament now because Paul really does a great job of taking these Old Testament principles that all the Jews knew and helping them come into Christianity. And I want to just keep an eye on the clock here. Don't you love this verse in Galatians 5.1? I'm giving it to you from the Amplified. It says, it was for this freedom that Christ set us free, completely liberating us. Like, isn't that a good statement of faith? Could we just say that out loud by faith? I am completely liberated from the bondage of sin, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus set me free from the law of sin and death. That's a good declaration, church. I'm telling you, say that on a regular basis. That's Romans 8, 1 and 2, right? Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ, those who are in Christ. You're not condemned anymore. Your sin has been paid for. You're not condemned anymore because the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set you free from that sin and death. So Paul says in Galatians 5.1, he set us completely free, liberating us. Therefore, keep standing firm. There's the contending part, right? Because every day we wake up, I, I believe you should start on your knees and invite the Lord in and say the Lord's Prayer. However, you know, not religiously, but in a way that says, Lord, I need your daily bread again. I, I recognize you. I'm hallowing your name. I'm worshiping you. I'm recognizing you're my king. And I don't want to be led into temptation by the world. So help me avoid every trap the enemy sets, every, every landmark. Lord, give me those night vision glasses that I can see it before I fall into that trap. And, and though he says, therefore, keep standing firm and don't be subject again to that yoke of slavery of those counterfeit affections. I've given you the power to be liberated from that. But then he warns us in verse 9, a little leaven, what? Leaven's the whole lump, just a little bit of leaven. If you saw the movie The Help, enough said. <laughs> verse 10, somebody got it over here. I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will have no other mind. <laughs> That's a dad speaking, isn't it? I just told you the deal. The enemy's going to try to leaven the whole lump with just a little bit of sin. But I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will not let that leaven in. <laughs> Verse 13, same chapter, but the message now. It says, God called you to a free life. Just make sure you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do. Anybody know what we call that in common vernacular now? Cheap grace. Have you ever heard of this? The fact that you're saved now means that God has to forgive you. So even if you sin, it's no big deal to God because all you have to do is ask for forgiveness. And Paul's like, no, 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 wait a minute. It's not a license to sin. The fact that you can be forgiven doesn't mean you should be loose and sloppy with your life. You're here. This is your window of opportunity. It's going to end someday. Make the most of it. This is your turn right now. Don't allow sin to cheapen you in that. He gave you a free life. Tap into it. Don't let these little foxes spoil your vine. Don't use the freedom. But what should you use your freedom for? This is powerful and I don't think really too well understood. He's tying that freedom of that bondage being broken into the ability that we have to serve other people. He says, don't let it be an excuse to do whatever you want to do and destroy your freedom by falling back into sin. Instead, rather, he says, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Wow, I don't know that a lot of people would have thought that would have been the answer. And, you know, just so you know, like David and I have been cultivating some relationships with some helps ministries in the region. So this past Tuesday, I was loading food off the back of a truck, bringing it into a warehouse with other people, all the other volunteers. We were sorting it out and taking out the cabbage over here and the tomatoes and the potatoes over here. And we were putting it in bags so that later in the day when people came to pick it up, they, you know, there was a whole process. It was a beautiful thing. You could say, well, I don't know. I mean, that doesn't sound very spiritual. <laughs> it doesn't take a whole lot of Bible knowledge to do that. But it does take a commitment in your heart to understand that this law says the freedom I get means as I've been blessed, I'm supposed to be a blessing, right? And even though I'll never meet the person who got the cabbage that I put in that bag, doesn't matter because we're in a kingdom. And this is the currency of the kingdom is that we love one another as Christ loved us. And it's unconditional. It's just 
I go there and I do the work for a couple hours and I contributed to the bigger picture of the kingdom. And people will say, like, why would you do that? It's because that's what God did for me, right? So as you give, you receive. If you never want to give anything, it's your choice. You don't have to, but it's a generous God. If you've taken out his nature, he puts this in you. And then he says, pretty profound, all the law is fulfilled in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, we know that from the golden rule, right, which is in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. Treat other people the way you'd want to be treated. That's that same concept. But this is actually from Leviticus. This was a verse that the Jewish people knew. From Leviticus 19, 18, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And if you looked at, I'll just pick one at random, Luke chapter 15, verse 1, it says that Jesus was standing and talking to the tax collectors and the sinners. And the Pharisees were nearby looking and disturbed by the fact that Jesus was talking to these lowlife people, okay? Now, yeah, it is a wow because the Pharisees were representing God. And they were looking down on these people, the sinners. And it says, this beautiful language says that the sinners were drawn to Jesus. They weren't drawn to the Pharisees. Why? Because the Pharisees were condemning them. That's what religion does. It tries to pull rank on you. So if the whole law is love your neighbor as yourself, it's the great equalizer. It's like, I'm going to treat you as another human being created in the image of God, regardless of your background, what country you're from, how much education you have. If you've got breath in you and you're a human being, you're, you're created in God's image. And if you need food, you should be able to come and get food, no strings attached. Huh. Sounds a little idealistic maybe, huh? Not what he said. If you're going to get free, use your freedom to serve one another in love. All the law is fulfilled in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus, Old Testament, 1918. Here's my instruction then. Walk in the Spirit and let the Spirit bring order to your life. That's the voice. For everything the flesh desires goes against the Spirit, and everything the Spirit desires goes against the flesh. There's a constant battle raging between them that prevents you from doing the good that you want to do. And then I just gave you a little bit of a, a commentary here that I thought was just beautifully written. So Paul makes the point that freedom is for love. Can you say that? Freedom is for love. One more time. Freedom is for love. Woo! Powerful truth. You can't just hold on to it yourself. But basically he's saying this law is a supernatural law. It's all fulfilled in love your neighbor as yourself, but effectively you can't do it in your own strength. Because if you take the freedom to do your, toot your own horn, then you're feeding your pride. And that's not why God sets you free. This is to feed the servant heart, like we have this down here, right? Jesus washing Peter's feet is the kingdom. He's the king of kings, yet he's a foot washer. And the people that have been impactful for God weren't egotistical. They weren't prideful. They were humble people. And God can pour his power through them because God knows they're not going to take it to their own account. And that's anybody. Some people are, are mightily gifted in the natural and still humble enough, and God uses them because he knows it's not going to inflate their ego. But that's a pretty big challenge, isn't it? So Paul makes the point that freedom is for love. He points to that Old Testament verse, Leviticus 19, 18, to love your neighbor as yourself as a key measure of fulfilling the Christian mission. So would you say that you know what your Christian mission is? Do you even think you have one? <laughs> I'm here to tell you, yes, you do. And we want to help you find it. You know, on a general rule, we are reflecting the nature of Christ into the world. We're his ambassadors. That's a mission that all of us have. We're all called to be ministers of reconciliation. And with Christmas coming at this 2020, with the election and all the stuff that's been going on in America, if ever there was a need for a ministry of reconciliation, boy, is this it, right? But who are we going to be? Which version of this? Is it about me or is it about the Lord? And if I'm representing the Lord, I just kind of get out of the way and say, okay, Lord, I want to treat them the way you want me to treat them, not the way my flesh wants to react right now. It's not impossible. He wouldn't ask us to be doing it if it was. 
And then this man said, this all-embracing commandment can't be obeyed by emphasizing who you are according to your flesh. It can only happen by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> That's really a profound thought. So let's just ask the Lord right now, Lord, help me yield on a minute-by-minute on a, on a -minute basis a greater yielding to your authority and to your spirit in my life so that I could be directed by the pure energy of heaven and not my ego and not my pride trying to creep in and take back over again and take control back over again. And one, uh, John Wimber was the one who said, how pure is the fuel in my engine? Right? So if it's pride and ego driving my behavior, that's not good fuel. So we want that pure fuel of heaven running us so that our motives are only bound by the Lord's desires, not by our desires. Amen?